Is that unholy bag of chips a little too tempting? Are you filled with unrighteous regret after binge eating on the couch? Well, not anymore. Introducing the Medieval Saint Diet. You'll be performing miracles in no time when you eat this medieval salmon with green sauce. So thank you to Bright Sellers for sponsoring this video as we explore the diet and miracles of Saint Columba. This time on Tasting History. So this is the first episode that I am recording after getting back from Scotland. And while we were there, we visited the amazing island of Iona. The island is the birthplace of Celtic Christianity in Scotland when it was brought over from Ireland in the 6th century by Saint Columcilla, better known as Saint Columba, not to be confused with Saint Columbo. And this guy, Saint Columba, well, he's got stories. And many have to do with food, and they're just, they're fantastic. And so I figured I needed to do an episode. So Columba was born in Ireland in 521, supposedly the grandson of the semi-mythical high king Nial of the Nine Hostages. They had such cool names back then. Anyway, Columba got into some hot water when he made a copy of the Gospels, and he wasn't supposed to, and it ended up causing a pitched battle, and a lot of people died, and so Columba felt bad, and he took off and left Ireland, and sailed until he found an island where he couldn't see Ireland anymore, that was the Isle of Iona. There he built an abbey, but not before expelling all of the snakes from the island, just as St. Patrick had expelled all of the snakes from Ireland. But in an effort, I guess, to outdo St. Patrick, he decided to also expel the women. See, he wanted cattle on the island, but he said, where there is a cow, there is a woman, and where there is a woman, there is mischief. So he made all the women live on a different island just a little ways away, and even today, that island is known as Elin Namban, or the Women's Island. So no ladies, but his fondness for cows does give us a glimpse at something that St. Columba might have eaten. The monks made butter and cheese, and it's likely that they also ate beef at certain times. Though, as a monk, beef or any kind of meat was definitely an indulgence. And so seafood was his main source of protein, and he did seem to like seafood. He was a fan of seal meat. There are actually several stories about people trying to steal his seals. And in one story, when he was with some fishermen, after they had caught five fish in their net, St. Columba said, again, cast the net in the river, and you will quickly find a great fish which the Lord has provided for me. And that fish was a salmon, and since I'm not about to eat a seal, it is salmon on the menu today. The issue is that while I've covered medieval dishes on this channel many times before, they're almost always from the very late Middle Ages when recipes really started to be written. But St. Columba lived at the very beginning of the Middle Ages, only about 150 years after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. And while it is wrong to call these the Dark Ages, especially in and around Ireland, they're definitely the Dim Ages when it comes to writings about food. So using two later medieval recipes, we can kind of put together a dish that St. Columba might have eaten. First, the Registrum Coquine suggests if you want to simmer salmon, add wine and parsley, and it will be good. And so it will, but it'll be even better when served with the Liber Cure Cocorum's green sauce, or Verdi Salsa. Take parsley, thyme, an ounce, and grind. Take white bread grated by kind. Mix all up with vinegar or wine. Season it with powder of pepper fine. So most of these ingredients would have been available around the island at the time. The only things that would have needed to be imported would be the pepper and the wine. And while the spice trade definitely wasn't as robust as it had been during ancient Rome, nor as it would be later on in the Middle Ages, pepper never really stopped making its way into Europe and the wine would have kept flowing from the south as well, especially if you were involved in the church. And even if there wasn't any wine and all you had was water, if you're St. Columba, it didn't seem to matter. One time, when there was no wine for communion, Columba picked up a pitcher and went to the well to draw water. He called on Christ to do as he had at the wedding at Cana and turn that water into wine, which he did. Columba returned from the well to the church and put the full pitcher down beside the altar. Here, you have wine. Unfortunately, despite my continued best efforts, 
I have been unable to turn water into wine, so my wine will be coming from today's sponsor, Bright Cellars. I love being introduced to new wines from Bright Cellars, and we've been working together for a while, and now they really have my tastes down. So when you start, you take a quiz on their website that lets them know what your tastes are, and then they send you a curated box, and then you tell them what you liked and what you didn't like, and so the next box is even more in tune with your tastes. In this box, I got Apostate Zinfandel from Sonoma Valley, which I'm really excited to try, but as much as I like the new wines, sometimes I like the old wines, the things that they've already sent, like this Alptraum Blaufränkisch. It has wonderful flavors of dark berries and baking spices, and it's really perfect this time of year when it's starting to cool down, though here in California, I think we still got a little while to go, but I'm already feeling the holiday spirit. So to get started with Bright Sours, visit the link in the description, and for a limited time, Bright Sours is giving viewers of Tasting History 50% off of their first six bottle box. Just visit the link in the description to get started today. Now while the red is perfect for sipping, you're gonna want something white to poach the salmon in. So I am using this Colorfast Riesling so I don't end up with dark purple salmon. Now reserve about a half cup back for the sauce, but everything else pour into a large pot to poach the salmon. I'm using about two pounds or one kilogram of wild salmon. I prefer to leave the skin on when poaching so the fish stays together better uh, and just makes life easier, even if you don't want to eat the skin because it's not going to crisp up like if you were roasting it. Then you also want to add a handful of torn parsley leaves, then add a bit of water, just enough to make sure that it will cover the salmon. Now, you can do shallow poaching if you're using a very thin filet, but salmon's a little bit thicker usually, so I do a, a full-on poach where it is completely submerged. So you want to bring the water to a boil before you add the salmon, and then reduce the heat and let the temperature drop to about 175 Fahrenheit or 80 degrees Celsius. Then add the fish to the water and let it cook undisturbed for 10 minutes, during which time you can prepare your sauce. And this is a really easy sauce to make. It takes no time because it is not cooked. For it, you just need a large handful of parsley. You want to use a flat leaf parsley because it's going to have more flavor. And then chop it up as fine as you possibly can. Then you'll need a couple tablespoons of thyme as well. Then you'll need some fresh bread without the crust. Then about a half teaspoon of pepper, as well as some white wine vinegar. So first, grind the herbs with a mortar and pestle until you have a paste. Then soak the bread in the vinegar and add a bit to the herbs. You're not going to need very much bread. It's better to have more available because that's going to be how you're going to really make it thicker or, or thinner, that and the wine. So grind the vinegar-soaked bread with the herbs until it's nice and smooth, and then add that remaining wine to create a sauce. Then finish off the sauce with a bit of pepper and set it aside. Then take the salmon out of the poaching liquid and let it cool. And you can eat this warm, but Columba probably would have eaten it either at room temperature or even cold. Eating cold food was often seen as more, more holy than eating warm food. That's the devil's temperature. So we've established that Columba was indeed a saint. And today we have kind of an idea of what a saint would be, you know, uh, spread Christianity to the Picts, did a lot of miracles, very devout, that whole thing. But if you actually read the lives of the early saints, it's often not what you would expect. Columba's life was written just a hundred years after Columba's death, and it is truly fantastic in the most literal sense of the word. See, the point of the work was to catalog all of the miracles that Columba had performed, and many of them had to do with food, and many of them had to do with death. See, uh, Columba was all about the, the prophecies, and usually when he gave a prophecy about you, it was time to start putting your affairs in order. He was a lot like Bruno. But while we don't talk about Bruno, no, no, we are going to talk about Columba. So Columba spent much of his life on the Isle of Iona, living in a hut on a mound of earth, which is actually still there. And someone would come by and knock on his door and be like, hey, you know, Columba, it's time for dinner, or I got a question, whatever. And uh, he would turn around and say something like, two men of royal lineage have died today in Ireland of wounds each inflicted on the other. And inevitably, the prophecy death would happen. I don't think it's quite as impressive as the water into wine, but it happened a lot. One time, the monks asked him to have Cronon, the poet, who had just left a little while earlier, to come back and entertain them. And he said, Why ask such a pointless question? His enemies have murdered him. 
Now, some of the death prophecies were just like, this person's going to die, and then they did. But others seem to kind of be a little personal, even used as, as a form of punishment. And Columba would often incorporate food into these so we can see a bit of what people around Iona and Scotland were eating in the 6th century. One story tells of a man going by in a chariot, and Columba asks his friend, who's that guy? And his friend's like, oh, he's a wealthy man, very well respected here in the community. But Columba responds, that is not how I see him. He sees him on the day of his death, after just having a cow slaughtered. Then he will ask for some meat to be cooked and served to him lying in bed with his oar. But the first mouthful he takes will choke him to death. It definitely seems personal. And it's not even the only time he predicted the death of somebody who was in bed with a lady of affordable virtue. Though, the term used could also just be a second wife, but clearly Columba didn't really approve of that either. And it wasn't just people that he could kill with a word, but also animals. Once on the Isle of Skye, he and his monks were walking through a forest, and a boar came running along with hunting dogs in pursuit. So I guess to help the hunt along, Columba raised his hand and said to the boar, Go no further, but die where you are now. And the boar just keeled over. Quite the miracle. Actually, Columba helped a lot of people when it came to hunting and, and getting food. There were several stories of him turning five cows into 105 cows. And one man, he gives some barley seeds to plant, but it's way too late in the season to have them actually grow. But miraculously, when it came time for the reaping, there was plenty of barley. Another had to do not with the quantity of food, but with the quality of it. There was a fruit tree near the monastery at Duro, and it actually put out a lot of fruit. But it was bitter, and everybody complained that the fruit sucked. It was kind of like grapefruit, I'm guessing. So Columba said, In the name of Almighty God, all your bitterness shall leave you, and your fruit until now most bitter shall become most sweet. He also gave away some high-quality salt in what has to be his most useless miracle. There was a man whose wife was sick with an eye disease, so Columba gave him a block of salt to hang on pegs on the wall over her bed. But a few days later, misfortune fell and fire destroyed the entire village, including this woman's house. Marvelous to tell, though the rest of the house was completely burnt, the fire did not dare to touch the two pegs on which this salt block was hanging. There were actually several miracles that were overshadowed by subsequent tragedy. Like when a young man fell off of his horse into a river and drowned, his body being submerged for 20 days. And he had been carrying a book with him, so the book was also under the water. And when they got it out, the entire book had rotted away, except for one page on which Columba had written. Sorry about your son, but my autograph still looks fantastic. Silver lining. Now, these miracles that end up not being quite as helpful as perhaps intended culminate in a hunting stick. A beggar comes up to Columba, begging for food for him and his wife and family. And so Columba gives him alms, but then also gives him a blessed stick. Keep this sharp stick carefully. It will not harm any man, I believe, nor any cattle. But with it you may kill wild animals and fish. So he goes home and sticks the stick in the ground, and the next day, a stag had just impaled itself on it. It was food for a month. And every single night, some other animal would get stuck on this holy punji stick. But his wife, who hadn't heard St. Columba, worried that if a man or a cow fell on the stick, they would die and the family would be punished. And after quite a bit of nagging, the man decides to take up the stick. But the stick has only one thing to do, and it's to kill, and it will kill. He takes the stick and puts it in the house. Next day, their dog is dead. So he takes it and throws it into the river. Salmon kebabs, tosses it into the brambles. Most animals never go in the brambles, but goats do, and next day he has a goat. He even throws it up onto the roof of the house, and a raven just comes down and impales itself on the stick. Finally, the man takes the stick and chops it up and throws it into the fire. No more stick and no more food. So it was really less of a miracle and more of a Adam and Eve allegory about not listening to your wife. And if you read a lot of the writings, Columba clearly was not a fan of women. Now, while there are plenty more hunting miracles, there are also some milk miracles too. 
One is, is lovely, the second, more disturbing. The first was when a young man named Coleman asks Columba to bless his pail of milk that he had just filled. Columba called on the name of God and blessed the vessel, which at once shook violently. The peg which held the lid shot back some distance, the lid crashed to the ground, and most of the milk spilled on the earth. And the kid's like, uh, my milk, what's up? But Columba says there was a devil at the bottom of the pail, and really it's the kid's fault because he should have been a little more aware when filling the pail. Always check your pail for, for devils. Lesson learned, and Columba was nice enough to refill the pail with with some more milk. So it's kind of like one and a half miracles. Now the second, definitely more disturbing milk miracle is when Columba commands a sorcerer to fill a pail of milk. Not from a cow, but from a bull. And he fills the entire thing full. And it's not what you're thinking. Rather, it uh, was cow blood that Satan had drawn all of the color out of, leaving it white, looking like milk. Not really much better, but a little better, I guess. Also, I don't really see that it's a miracle as much as just a, a weird story. Now, another part of leading a saintly life at this time was not overindulging in food. Much of the year, meat was not allowed and only seafood could be eaten. And if you did something wrong, one way to, to make up for it was to change your eating habits and eat very little and, uh, and you know, not, not exciting food. And there was actually an island where it was all penitence, so everyone could come together and be less tempted to stray, I guess. But when it came to food, Columba actually wasn't as strict as you might think. So one time when he visited this island, he lifted all of the penitential eating rules for everyone. Everyone was, was very, very happy. But one guy, Nimin McCathier, turned down the saint's offer. Big mistake. Big. Huge. Columba sat him down and said, Neiman, I have allowed the relaxation in the diet, and you refuse it. But the time will come when, in the company of thieves, in the forest, you will eat the flesh of a stolen mare. And as we've seen, when Columba says something's gonna happen, it's probably gonna happen. And after he finally got off of this island, he found himself eating just such meat taken from a wooden griddle. And let us set aside the impractical nature of a wooden griddle and instead focus on the 7th century Irish penitentials, which said the penance for eating horse flesh four years on bread and water. Which means this guy, after eating the horse, would have been sent back to the island and would have had to do the whole thing all over again. So as you see, food was very important, not just for eating, but for using as reward or punishment. But before you go around using food as a weapon, I suggest we at least try this salmon with green sauce. So once the salmon has cooled, sprinkle it with a bit of salt and pepper. And thank you to Dr. Gottwoods for sending me this pepper mill to end all pepper mills. And then pour the sauce over the fish and serve it forth. And here we are, medieval salmon with verdi salsa. Let's do it. Now it is uh, slightly chilled, um, but the sauce is not. So sauce, room temperature, fish chilled. Mmm. So the fish is very nice, just kind of flakes, flakes apart, um, and you do get a little bit of that wine flavor in it, but the sauce is definitely the, the dominant flavor, and it's wonderful. It's super herby. Um, herby. Uh, it's not like Kermit there. Um, it's, it's very, very herb-forward, and uh, which is, is really nice, kind of fresh and light, but then you get hit with that little bit of vinegar. It's not vinegary at all but that little bit in there kind of cuts through the fattiness of the fish and, and just like brightens up the palate. Also, there's a little spice at the very end from, I guess from the pepper, but I didn't use that much, but it doesn't taste like black pepper when, when kind of mixed with all of the other ingredients. It's really, really nice. This is actually something that I would just make today. And it really is kind of the perfect Lent time dish for a monk and, or any fish day, which was a lot of days out of the year. Now, these early medieval monks were very focused on the strict eating rules. But later on in the Middle Ages, you see that the monks start to try to get around these eating rules so they can eat whatever they want. So, if you want to learn about that, and I suggest that you do, you can watch this video right here and I will see you next time on Tasting History.